Welcome to Back Chat from Headingley. And don't you love the smell of autumn with semi-finals and finals and million pound games and test series all on the horizon. So to celebrate, we brought a whiff of nostalgia into the studio today. We're joined by Danny Lockwood from League Weekly, whose best memories begin and end in the 1970s. So Gary Schofield, who won 46 caps playing for Great Britain. I had to look that up because he very, very rarely mentions that. And alongside him, alongside both of them, is the great Brett Kenny. Arguably the best player of all time. I say arguably, if you do want to argue about it, I'm going to have to fight you because he is the best player of all time. Famous over, over here, of course, for the 1985 Challenge Cup final Wigan against Hull. Great to see you, Brett. Right, let's start with um, the way it's been going in the last few weeks. The top eights, the super eights. Who could have predicted that we'd end up with a final week of the season like we've got? Well, uh, when we looked at it from last year, and people seem to buy into the situation where Leeds won the Challenge Cup after 15 years and all that emotion drained them and took it out of it. And that was a good excuse that people bought into that. After we've seen what happened in the Challenge Cup final this year, it wasn't the hardest of games for Leeds, as we all know they beat Oakies and Robots 50-0. Would they have picked out the two fixes after Wembley? Um, said Talons at home, Catalans away? Maybe not. But then I thought, yeah, after them two defeats, back on the horse against Castleford, and then they're on again to win the League Leader Shield, they're going to win the treble, as we were all predicted. I tell you what, these Leeds players at the moment, they seem to be still buying into that emotion. Mm. See, the pressure seems to be on that they don't want to repeat what happened last year, and I don't think that Leeds, at this moment in time, are playing with that expression, that expansion, mm. what has brought them, how they've been go so good so far I'd, before I'd, Wembley. I'd, I'd, I'd take issue with that, Gary. I think they're almost playing with too much of that. I think there's a fatigue, they look fatigued. They're, 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 they're well, I don't buy into fatigue at all, Dave. I don't no, buy into no, time. These are professional athletes, and, they're, and you know, there's no reason why they've got a big squad of leads. OK, they've carried a couple of injuries, but there's no reason why they should be performing like this. The, the wheels have dropped off, the confidence has gone. I saw that, that defeat against Castleford, and, and hats off to Daryl Powell and his boys, by the way. But I saw that, and I saw something I haven't seen in Leeds all year, which was a soft middle. You know, mm. th th there's just something not happening there. I, I don't know if they're kind of expecting it to happen because it did for so long, Woodsy. But the, the problem that they have now is that they've, you know, obviously not by any intent, they've delivered us the perfect final weekend mm. of the season. Four teams, one point, four possible champions, all to play for. Um, I think the big question, of course, is can Leeds get, you know, having lost the confidence, and they absolutely have, can they just switch it back on and get back on the bike? Brett, you've, you've had a bit of an experience with this, haven't you? 1985, famously the final, 28-24, you score a try, you came out with your hands in your pockets and your tracksuit and all the rest of it, and Henderson Gill goes down the wing and Sean Edwards comes down the middle, Cheers, John yeah, Ferguson, yeah, thanks, couple thanks what, were you, yeah. do you go that day? For that. I didn't notice you, were you there that day? Well, I was, sat, I, was sat, I was sat on the bench for 60 minutes, thanks for that day. Yeah, 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 right, you're very welcome, you're very welcome. And, and you won the Lansdowne Trophy, of course, man of the match in your battle with Peter Sterling, but then the following Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday, you were in a Premiership game, playoff game against St Helens, and you had a stinker, it's fair to say. Yeah, you know, it, 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 for me, mentally, it was very tough um, to back up after such a big, a, a big event. And I, I do, I call playing at Wembley an event. It's not just a football game, it's an event, you know. And um, I, I guess not having experienced that sort of thing before over here, um, and used to playing back home in Australia where... To me, Wembley, playing at Wembley in the Challenge Cup final was like playing in our grand final. Once you play in the grand final, win or lose, that's it, season's mm. over. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was quite difficult to, to go from such a high and then come back. And I'm not saying mm. that playing in the semi-final is a low, but when you look at what we did at Wembley and then you come back and I think we played at Knowlesley Road and, and to me it was just very, very hard to get myself up to play in that game. And, I mean, I did. I had a shock. Was, was, it, was, it a men, was it a mental hangover, <coughs> Brett, or was it a physical one? <laughs> well, well I, look, I, I think a, a bit of both, you know. You, but, but I think probably more so, maybe, you know, 70% mental and 30% and physical mm. because you, you still had time to recover sure. physically. But, but mentally, you just weren't there. You, it, it was just, you think, well, I thought, you know, why are we playing here? Yeah. Why are we doing this? Yeah. We've just played in one of the greatest games ever. And here we are backing up and playing in something else, which, I, I, as I said, I found very hard to, to do. And, and as you said, you know, and, and keep reminding me, yes, I did have a shocker. <laughs> but there's a story there as well, isn't there? Because the, the, the story around the you know, rugby league rumour around was that you'd thrown the game or that the Wigan team as a whole had thrown the game. You wanted to get back to Australia. And you got dropped from the Australian squad as a result of that, didn't you? Which was a scurrilous, a scurrilous rumour. Oh, no, no, I never got dropped from the Australian squad, but... But the coach at the time, who was Don Furness, said if, if it was true, 
what they'd written in the papers, he said he would not have me in the team. But then, mm. as it was, it, it wasn't true. What what I'd actually said to the, the the guy doing the report asked me, was there any particular part of the game that you recall? And I said, oh well, yeah, you know, I said I threw a really bad pass. I've I've got made half a break. I've tried to throw the ball over the top of a defending player to hit my guy, and it went over both heads and and um, it went over the sideline, you know, and I said it was just a pretty ordinary sort of play. And, and from there, he's put in the report and because later on, he spoke about, oh, well, you know, yes, we, we come home after the game, but I didn't leave for another week or two. Yeah. Um, but the way he's put it in is that my wife was at the gates waiting for me with their bags packed, and as soon yeah. as we game finished, we were off, and that wasn't the case. Journalists, huh? Who would, yeah. would have them? Who would <laughs> talk to them? <laughs> I, remember, I remember him throwing a pass once at Central Park, and he hit Henderson Gill. I think you were standing in the middle of the field, and you hit Henderson Gill, who was coming through, and, and I think, I don't know whether he, he scored or not, but the whole crowd just gasped. There was no cheer, it was just a gasp at the, the quality of the pass. Anyway, we can sit here all day have and Have you brought your like, autograph yeah. book? Have <laughs> you brought your autograph book? We'll have a few selfies at the end. Anyway, back to, back to matters over here and right now at the moment. So Leeds 39, Wigan 39, Huddersfield 38, St Helens 38. Wigan now have to play Castleford at home. St Helens have to play Warrington at home. And Huddersfield take on Leeds absolutely mouthwatering. Who's going to win the League Leader's Shield? Well, one thing for sure, Woodsy, and I'm getting a little bit uh, criticism at the moment, um, certainly from the ranks from Huddersfield, I'm meant to believe, and quite clearly, um, Huddersfield's put a marker down this week. Okay, Leeds are out of sorts at the moment. If Kevin Sinfield doesn't play, then yes, certainly you'll fancy Huddersfield. But what I would like to say to Huddersfield is, listen, fellas, Paul, you players, prove me wrong. Mm. You won the League Leader's Shield a couple of years ago, you bottled it. Last year, you qualified for the, the playoffs, you bottled it. So now you're making all the noises. I know, you, I know you're going about your business pretty quietly, but listen, prove me wrong, shut me up, and handle big games and don't ball it. And this week against Leeds, I'll put a marker down. So, <coughs> Huddersfield, it's all in your hands. You know, there's 95% of the audience hoping it's they win now because it will shut you up. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it, it, it's, it's the perfect Hollywood script, isn't it? It's the perfect ending. Anybody can win it. It's, it's, it, it goes, actually, and, and I know, Scott, who you're going to tip when we come round to it, but it actually goes with the table, doesn't it, Dave? Yeah. It's in Leeds' hands first and foremost. What he said there about Kevin Sinfield is absolutely critical. If they go into that game without Sinfield, it's very difficult to see them upset in Huddersfield, in the form Huddersfield are in. And then you've got to say that it's in Wigan's own hands. You know, they're in prime position now. I would say that they're probably the favourites because, of course, as good as Cass are and as great as they've been, and as, and as much as they know how to beat Wigan, because they beat them 42, 14 yeah. earlier in the season, mm. you've got to fancy Wigan on their own midden, you know. And if and if if Leeds do slip up, then I think Wigan are, are the hot favourites to, to close. I the really job. don't understand why you guys are going through all this and who's going to win and whether Huddersfield can beat Leeds and this that. Now I'm telling you now, Wigan will win it. That'll be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no bias to say then. And he's uh, still got the loyalties. <laughs> but we've got the Australianised version now. And when we moved to the grand final, in what '98 was our first grand final, wasn't yeah. it? That well, you know, when you were playing um, in the '80s and, and, and up to the '90s in this country, winning the league in the regular season was a big thing, a big thing. But now that's gone out of the window. Um, how important is it in Australia to finish top of the ladder before the finals begin? Oh, very important. Um, actually, the first and second are, are very important. We have the but top. But is, is that in terms of because it gives you an advantage in the finals, or is it because we finish top of the regular season? I think more so it gives you an advantage. Um, yes, uh, if you finish first, you mind a premiership, and I, I, I think the clubs receive around about a hundred thousand dollars for that. So realistically, that, that's going to buy them a reserve grade player, that money. But, but um, I don't think that's the importance. The importance is that come finals time, you get the opportunity to to at least have a break if you if you win. If you get beaten, you're still there. Yeah. Um, and the, and of course, the top two teams both got beaten this year. Both got beaten, yeah. and, and and they, they needed the double jeopardy, and, and, yeah. and they both. Um, now fighting out for the fighting out for the for the grand final for the yeah. opportunity to play in the grand final. Is there any kind of mood in Australia to say we should make more of finishing top in the regular season, or or is everybody happy with the status quo? Oh well, you know you, you you talk to the players and they're always complaining that there's too many games. Yeah. I look at it this way and say, well, you know what, the amount of money they're earning, they should be playing more. Yeah. Um, I agree. I uh, agree. You know, the the not that you could. It probably wouldn't be able to make the competition any bigger than what it is as far as the games go, the amount of games, but 
Oh, you know, I, I just think it, it, it's fine the way it is. You know, the 26 rounds, they don't play 26 games. They have two buys. Yeah. So they're really only playing 24 games. And um, when you look at the top level guys, guys that represent Australia, play Origin, um, they're playing an extra four games. You know, three Origin games, one Test match. Mm. Uh, so, you know, they played every game leading up to the finals. They, they would have they played 80, 28. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the one thing to, speak, to say about the Australian system is it is a system and it's settled and everybody knows yeah. what it is. We're in the first year of a brand new system here and we've already got half the coaches and half the chairman talking about tweaking it and changing it and having a new playoff system in for next year. I think you know, the, the absolute vindication of what we've, what we've had this season, Dave, is that Castleford, seemingly with nothing to play for, can go turn over the league leaders' leads in the way that they did and the fact that we've come down to the final week and anybody, it's anybody's to win. So mm. I think you know, I think there's a lot to be said for that and, mm. and I know Lee Ratford was concerned about his boys all not having that much to play for, same for Catalan. You, you can't have it perfect every way you know yeah. and, I th and I think that what we've got is a, is a good reason to stick with what we've got for next year. You see I'm, I'm quite excited about the fact that we've got three teams realistically who oh. can win the League Leaders' mm. Shield this weekend. So we've got two big games on a Friday night going back to back, Leeds Huddersfield, uh, Wigan against Cass, and you'll be bobbing between the two to find out who's going to win that League Leaders' Shield. I feel as I'm in a minority in terms of thinking it's really important to finish top of the league. Oh yeah, I, uh, I, I would agree with that. But also as well, when you uh, so when we look over the last two or three weeks and everybody thinks being about Leeds, Leeds and Leeds, and I've been quite critical of, I guess, St. Helens over the last few weeks as well, certainly the, the, the half-back partnership, and the combination's not there, but i tell you what, they're just sneaking up very, very quietly at the moment. Yeah. Well, they can't win it. They can't win no, the No, I'm, I'm not about winning well, the league this year, but what I'm saying is, with the confidence of the form coming in, they will be pretty happy with it. No, they can't win the league leader no. shield. But to be honest with you, anybody who's, uh, you know, say for instance, Wigan finished top and Huddersfield finished second, St. Helens or, or Leeds won't be frightened of going to have no. the, the, uh, the for, DW or going for to For Saints, uh, it's going about to getting the win and hopefully getting the home game, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. They want yeah. to be top yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, just home to, but just to nail this, should we be making more of winning the league leader's shield? I agree. Three pieces of silverware the Challenge Cup, the grand final trophy, and the league leader shield. Should we be making more of that? You mean the silver hub cap? I think that you know the fact that the that the award has got a nickname that's as derogatory as it is, Dave, tells you everything about it. Yeah. I think the clubs, the chairman, like the money that they get for finishing top of the pile. The coaches like the fact that they're guaranteed, you know, the the the, the home draw, if you like. I don't think you can change the fact that the grand final absolutely massively, <laughs> like the menu, minor premiership. Nobody remembers the minor premiers. They remember you know, the grand final winners. Yes. And I don't think you can change that mentality however you tweak with it. I exactly. just don't think well, you can. I, I was going to say, Ed, as you mentioned, you, you ask people who were the minor premiers last year, they wouldn't be able to tell you, but you know, who won the premiership, they can tell you. So that sort of shows you that, yes, it is important um, and, and it is an honour. It's something that the, the club should be very proud of, but realistically, you want to win a premiership. Mm. Yeah, they're and they're so close to each other as well that you can't lift, you know, we try to do it three times in about six weeks here, don't we? With Wembley, which I still think is too late in the, uh, in the calendar, and then the race for the League Leader Shield, and then the grand final on the back of it. Yeah. I, I just, I well, just think I'll it's I'll a bit I'll artificial. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we should do then. Rather than, you know, celebrate by giving this silly little shield around, scrap that, just give them the money, just give them the money for finishing the top, and scrap all the, the, the award, what they get, scrap the celebrations, and then concentrate on the grand final. That's oh, what we should I, do. I love that, I love that. I love that. I mean, Huddersfield, well, when Huddersfield won it, it meant oh, something. It, me yeah. it meant something. But only I mean, because I, it was, but only because they've not it, won anything. Uh, since your, since since your, since your, years. But Dave, honestly, well, but that's what it's all but, about. But, you know, oh. they, they haven't won anything for 80 odd years and they go out through a season but, and they finish top. Castleford la uh, last year never won at the league title could have finished top for the first time in their history yeah, last year. We gone. should be celebrating. Well, well, what does it mean, though? It, it means, means that throughout the season, no. they've been when, fantastic. When Huddersfield won, as you said, they won the, the minor premiership. Yeah. It's the first thing they'd won for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. Did they win the premiership that year? They didn't, no. no but because they were so excited about winning the minor premiership, <laughs> that, was, job, about, job that was it for them. That was their grand final. Yeah. So I guess a lot of times it depends on the team. Leeds, Wigan, St Helens, they win minor premiership. I mean, any, because we've won premierships and... Whatever. So for them, they're more concerned about the grand final. Well, as you say, someone like Huddersfield who hasn't won yeah. anything for a long time. It, it's a great thing, but that's the unfortunate part about it is they get overawed by the whole thing and, and forget about well the job at hand, which is 
you've got to win the premiership now. You know, you've yeah. won the minor premiership, you've now got to win the premiership. Well, you see, I'm assuming against the tide against all three of you, Sex, but you're all a lot older than me, so I bow to your, uh, your experience, all of you. Um, but <laughs> what I would say is that to, to finish on top of the pile at the end of a season, that should be celebrated. I know there's another, there's the grand final is possibly a bigger prize and all the rest of it, but I think we should have more celebration. Fair enough, we, you know, we'll let you have your way, Dave. You know. well, well, I won't, because <laughs> I'll but tell you why, I won't. I'll tell you why, because when Leeds finished fifth and won it and took it away from Huddersfield who finished the top, nobody cared less, Dave. No, no. Yeah. It should not be celebrated like he does. Scrap it, give him still the same money, without a doubt, financial reward, I'll agree with that. But as far as the celebration, Nobody cares. Even the supporters couldn't care less about it. They don't stay around the ground and wait for the celebration. Scrap that celebration and then move on to the grand final. Right. <laughs> we will be back in just a few moments' time. I'm going to wait for a sulk, but you can watch the adverts <laughs> and we'll be back in just a few moments' time. See you in just a moment. Welcome back to the Ark in Headingley. We've uh, had our discussion during the break. Turns out I was right all along. Right, we didn't get um, the, the all everyone's predictions for who's going to win the grand final, because apparently that's more important, according to you three. Who's going to win the grand final? So who's going to win the grand final? Four teams in it. Um, we know, we don't know who's going to get home advantage yet in terms of the semis, but, but who's going to win the grand final? Um, my head says the Leeds Rhinos. My heart says... The Leeds Rhinos. I think they're going to bounce back this weekend, Dave. I think they're going to get back on the horse, whether there's Ke Kevin Sinfield or not. Uh, and I think they're going to uh, end JP and Kevin Sinfield's careers in absolute glory. So, so the still the Rhinos, I'm hanging on. You're predicting they'll win at Huddersfield? Well, I'm a Yorkshireman. I think that they, even if they don't win at Huddersfield, even if they don't win at Huddersfield, they can get back enough form to, to make it to Old Trafford and, and, and win on the night. If they don't win at Huddersfield, they could actually finish fourth. Mm, it is, yeah. In uh, fact, the probability is they will finish fourth if they don't win They could do. And I say Huddersfield again, as I've mentioned, looking to put a marker down and, and get sure of that label that they can't uh, handle pressure. But if Sinfield is not fit, then Leeds cannot win the grand final without him. But if, if he manages to come back for the first semi-final, then uh, maybe Leeds, if Sinfield's there. If not, Leeds will not win it. And for mine, they'll be St Helens. Right, St Helens. Mm. Big call. You wouldn't have said that four or five weeks ago. No, you wouldn't. No, no. And as I say I was a little bit critical, certainly of the halfbacks. And as we all, the steady influence as John Wilkin has come back, he's seen to a steady the ship. So uh, if Sinfield's not fit, the Leeds won't win it. And for mine, it be St. Helens. And I wonder who Brett Kenny's predicting to win the grand final. Sorry? <laughs> Who's Brett Kenny predicting to win the grand final? Wigan. Yeah. They haven't got a problem with that. I think they'll, <laughs> you know, they'll come home strong and, you know, they'll. Yeah. I'll win it with you. You know, Mike Ford's not playing this weekend. Mike Ford's not playing. Brian Casey's out. Nicky Kiss <laughs> missing. Henderson Gill, John Ferguson both away. Steve Donlan, Dave Stevenson. None of them are playing. <laughs> None of them are playing this weekend, but you're still predicting Wigan. Still predicting to win. Wigan, Wigan win. There's yeah. obviously a big place in your heart for Wigan. Parramatta yeah. boy, would you consider yourself a Parramatta player or a Wigan player? Oh, I was a Parramatta player, yeah. you know. I've, I've played there for 13, 13 seasons, but um, yeah, had a good time at Wigan. They're great people and. and um, Enjoyed playing my football there, and the guys that I played with were great blokes. And and the, the, one of the pleasing things for me was I left, finished there at the end of the '85 season, and then 1986 I come back on the Kangaroo tour, and there were some of the guys that I played with at Wigan are now playing international football. You know, and I thought yeah. that was great. You know, to yeah. see these younger guys coming through and, and go on and achieve something like that. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, fond memories there of, of Wigan. And just a question, just just briefly on nostalgia again, John Ferguson. How good a winger was he, and why did he not win more Australian Cups? Well, probably because we did have quite a few good wingers running around at the time. But yeah, look, he was as chicker as he's known. He, he, he was a magnificent player, and, and um, I remember one of the tries he scored at Wembley, where he's actually down on his haunches. He, he thought he was injured, and and I think Scurry's thrown a bad pass and <laughs> or dropped the ball. <laughs> Um, I don't really know, but the ball's landed there, it's on the ground. Next thing, Chick is up, taking the ball and run yeah. and scored the try, you yeah. know. And, and um, these were the sorts of things he was doing back in Sydney. And, um, but the, the situation was, I mean, he played for New South Wales. And, and, but as I say, there was a lot of wingers running around, a lot of quality players who had already, I guess you could say, had the jump on him. Mm. They'd already mm. been selected to play for Australia on a few occasions. So. 
he, he found it very difficult to, to break into the team, but uh, certainly would have been worthy of an Australian jumper without any problem. OK, back to the present. Huddersfield, why, why are you not suggesting that they <coughs> I, I could think win the uh, grand final? Uh, probably the point that Gary made earlier, you know, challenging them to deliver on the big day. So far, they, they just haven't done it. Um, they're probably the form team of the top four right at the moment. Uh, Jermaine McGilvery is, is in absolutely sensational form. I think we'll be seeing him in the dream team next week. Mm. Um, no reason other than Leeds just have that pedigree and I think they've got it in the memory banks of how to win the big games. And like Scoy said, not quite sure yet that Huddersfield have got that. Right. What would it, well, I know what it would take for them to convince you. It would take them to win the big games. But have you not been con certainly reassured by the way they've, they've, they've finished? <coughs> to be honest with you, no. Uh, I said the last time I saw them was when they played Castleford a couple of weeks ago. And uh, when you looked at, at, that, at that game, for the first 15 minutes in the first half, it was all Castleford. Huddersfield had 25 minutes in that first half. The second half, it was 25 minutes cast, 15 minutes Huddersfield. That convinces me, if they give that sort of time to uh, a Leeds team, a Wigan team, or a St. Helens, whoever they're going to play in the semi-finals, they won't get, get themselves back into the game. So the worrying factor is, and, and I'm sure Paul Anderson will be addressing this when he's in the dressing room and doing his analysis, will be quite simple. We need to put, realistically, to beat these teams, not just in the qualifying semi-finals, to get to the grand final, mm. and win the grand final, is the 80 minutes performances in that team and I don't think there is and so that's the challenge for mine to the Huddersfield players and the coach Paul Anderson can he see that in his players and handle the pressure as well to play for the full 80 minutes yeah, so and, I, and, and I'm not convinced at this moment in time so is this a real start of the test never mind the semi-finals a week ahead is, it is. this the first test then <coughs> it is Leeds? it is because Leeds as we know now three defeats after Wembley they certainly now want to want to make sure that they're going in with plenty of confidence. So this weekend, it's the marker down for Huddersfield, for people like myself to be a little bit quiet on Huddersfield chances to say, hey, there could be serious contenders. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such an exciting time of the year, isn't it? You know, in Australia, you've got the two semi finals, which we'll talk about in, in more depth in the third part. We've got the fantastic end to the league mm. season, then the two mm. semi finals, and the million pound game. Let's just touch on this before we move off this. Mm. Uh, the million pound game, which looks like it's going to be Wakefield against Bradford one way or another yeah I can't really see uh, Bradford putting enough points on a very good Halifax team um, to get above Wakefield even if Wakefield happened to lose which I don't think they will it looks like it's going to be back at Bellevue it's going to be Wakefield Bradford I would imagine the place will be absolutely rocking yeah. because Bradford will take a yep. good crowd over there and I think it's played up for what we all probably anticipated we, the only question really for most of us was is it going to be Bradford is it going to be Lee Bradford have come home strong They've got a bit of a worrying habit of dropping off a week, hitting a week. But if they follow that pattern, they should be up for yeah. when they play Wakefield in a fortnight. Yeah. So I, get, I guess we mind with that question is, you know, uh, Wakefield beat Bradford, what, two or three weeks ago by 30 odd points. Can Bradford close that down, Danny, to be honest? Can, can they get that 30 point marker back and beat Wakefield? If, I just think uh, if maybe they a bit play, too much for them. If, if, they play, if they play like they did when they beat Salford, if they play like they did when. They went and beat a, a, a really competitive and confident Lee side last week. Then I think the answer is yes, they can. Will it be closer than it was in that in that game? Yeah. Without a doubt, it's without be, a shadow of a doubt, score. I think we're in for a real spectacle, it's and, a real it's, and it's a game I wouldn't miss for the and world. As you, and you, you mentioned the crowd; it, that it will be absolutely yeah, buzzing, morning Because the Wakefield fans, they'll all come out of the wardrobes, the cupboards, yeah. whatever you want to call it, and the Bulls, well, they will bring plenty. So it'll be a great crowd for the, for the chairman, Michael Carter, because yeah. I tell you what, some of the adversity he's been going through at this moment in time, uh, that, we need we need to put a smile back on Michael's yeah, face. What, what's happening off the field? What's happening off the field as well at Wakefield mm. can't be uh, you know understated. They've, they really have some problems that they need to address, and they've, you know, it's going to be a tough next couple of well, weeks. Well, I think he's doing very well, Michael Carter, at this moment in time. I he's a top man. He's a, great he's, a, he's a great person. He's leading that club from the front, and he's Absolutely. setting the right examples. He's doing a very good job. Yeah. He's managed very smartly all yeah. the way through this campaign, and he's got his, you know, he's just deserves a chance at least at redemption. Yeah. Cameo in there as well, um, Brian Smith against James Lowe's. You know, the, the uh, Brian Smith who brought James Laws' career on, really, because he, yeah. he bought him from Leeds, didn't he? And, well, uh, it's, it is, it's the master and the apprentice, isn't yeah. it? You know, and uh, as the old dog got all the, all the, all the tricks, or, yeah. as, the, or, or as, as young Laws, he got a few up his sleeve. I'll tell you what, when the cameras go on the two coaches, there won't be many smiles, will there? No, Jeez. no. <laughs> how, 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 I mean, how much of an impact is it making uh, in Australia that you've got Brian Smith over here and you've got Tim Sheens over here, two of the most respected, experienced coaches in the NRL, who are actually coaching at the moment in the second tier of, of English rugby league. Yeah, I, I guess um, you know, back home you would never have thought that would ever happen. 
Tim Sheens, of course, was a, um, the Australian rugby league coach. Yeah. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, they look at their, their positions and they say that's that's their job. They're, they're coaches. That's what they do for a living. And um, doesn't matter which team it is or, or what country it's in. That they, they want to earn a good living. They enjoy doing what they're doing. And and, and, and I guess in, in a lot of ways, it's probably a bit of a challenge for them. Mm. Um, you know, it'd be quite easy to come over and, and and get a job coaching a Super League team and, and that. But here we are, you know, they're, they're, they're in the, the next division below Super League and, and they're trying to help that club get up yeah. in, in, into Super League. And, and I think it would, they would find that um, very re rewarding to be able to say, well, yes, I came here. I got them up into Super League and yep. whether or not they kept coaching them after that yep. doesn't matter. So it would surely be a challenge for them, hasn't it? It does. <laughs> how, would you, how would you rate them? I mean, uh, you know, they are, we've talked about super coaches. We've got Wayne Bennett who could be winning another grand final this year. You know, what an extraordinary <coughs> career he's had as a coach. But how would you rate those two? And who would you put up there as well as in terms of the top coaches you've, you've come across? Oh, well, look, to me, Brian Smith is, is, a, is a coach that will all, I always believe would always have a job. And because... He seems to be able to come into clubs, back home he would come into a club that was at the bottom of the table and they were struggling both on the field and off the field. He was always able to come in, get them right, become more professional and get them on their way. Unfortunately, he was just never able to convert that into premierships mm. but got a lot of teams to grand finals. And um, I think, to me, that's, that's where he's good. That, that's his job. Um, as I said, not necessarily winning premierships, but at least turning clubs around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Tim Sheens, well, he's won a few premierships and is now coaching the Australian team. So, you know, he's, he's obviously got to be up there with one of the top coaches. But uh, Greg Bellamy, who coaches Melbourne, um, they've had a lot of success. Yeah. And, um, you know, you look at... He's definitely got something because you, you look at some of the players that they have come to Melbourne. Uh, a lot of them come from Queensland. There were other guys... Um, a few years ago, there was a guy playing for Penrith and he left Penrith, he went to the bush and everyone was saying he was looking to come to England because he was ready to retire. He didn't, he went to the bush. Next thing you know, Melbourne had picked him up and he's won a premiership yeah. with Melbourne. Yeah. And he was playing some well, outstanding you've football. You've taken a lot of our best players, Brett. You know, people like Sam Burgess, Sam Tompkins, maybe not so much, but we've got a, you know, a lot of lads down there, James Graham, um, you, you know, really sort of making an impression. Can you see the day when we start sending English or British coaches down there? Because, of course, you've got Trent Robinson that came up here, Michael Maguire that came up here, yep. really, you know, developed their skills as coaches and went back quite successfully. We've, we know, I think there was talk about Sean Wayne, Sean Wayne a little bit about past. going down to the Warriors. Yeah. You know, could you see the day when we could start exporting our best coaches as well? well I, I, Steve I can't see why, it, you know, I can't see why well, it can't happen. Yeah, you've, got, you've got players coming down. And as you mentioned, some of the coaches, Trent Robinson, you know, they, they're cutting their teeth over here yep. and mm -hmm. then coming back to Sydney. And, and he's, the respect he's got back there is, is tremendous. Um, mm. And the job he's done with the Roosters is amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I can't see why one day it can't happen. You know, yeah. obviously I would, I, I'll tell you what I would, yeah, I would debate that because quite, I reckon quite obviously <coughs> the Australian players and uh, the, the quality of what they've got, they wouldn't want to listen to an English accent telling them what to do and how to play the game of rugby league. Not a cat in else chance of an English coach. All right, we've had Malcolm Milley out there, but you know Malcolm was a little bit. He had the respect because he's, uh, you know, the best English player that's ever played in the uh, in the competition in Australia. But not a cat in else chance of an Australian club employing an English coach on the, on the basis of head coach and an Australian play, players listen to our accent. Well, maybe, not a cat in else chance. Maybe that's another opinion that Gary Scofield might have wrong. <laughs> the, future, the future will tell us. We'll inform us, and and we look forward to that day. Um, just going back to matters domestic, we've got the dream team announcement uh, coming up next week, and we've we talked about various players and positions. Um, dream team, we, we, yeah. Well, I think I mentioned I give a name check to Jam Jermaine McGilvery, who I think yeah. has put yeah. himself on the international radar this yeah, year, absolutely. as well as absolutely. Yeah. He won't we'll, let anybody down in England. No, well, let's start at yeah. fullback. I think we'd all, we'd all agree. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So, your two wingers, McGilvery. Yeah, I think the other ones are a toss up. Maybe Tom Lynham as an outside shot from Hull on his way to Warrington. Right. Um, you know, people will go for the, the usual suspects, people like Ryan Hall. Um, Josh Charnley, uh, Young Burgess is after a shaky start to the season. Making some, maybe you know, yeah. we've got some. Well, I go for Burgess because he's. I think he's second yeah, top try scorer behind. He's me, he's after a really shaky, 
you know, he, he announced his move to Australia. He, he really looked off his food at the beginning of the season, but he's come yeah. on strong. So yeah. he's a good shout for it, yeah. OK, centres. Well, one, yeah, one Callum, rats himself yeah, in, Callum Watkins. Callum Watkins. Has he made much of an impact in Australia, Callum Watkins? Uh, are people in Australia generally taking notice of what's happening in England? And, and who are the players who stand out, would you say? Oh, uh, uh, look, we, we, we get the Super League on, on the TV and, and, and that, but I, I think majority of people... Um, are concentrating more on the NRL. They, they, they probably, people I've spoken to, they'll, they'll look at the Super League and they'll watch games where they know there are Aussie players playing for that team. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's basically it, yeah. They, 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 so the answer is no. No, it's very, <laughs> it's a very polite <laughs> thing. So the answer yeah, is no. Yeah, but, they did, and, but, but the English players that have come out yeah. um, get a huge following. James yeah. Graham, yeah. I think, has been the most outstanding. Outside of Sam Burgess last year, yeah. James Graham has been amazing for, for uh, the Bulldogs and, and Gareth Widdop for St George of He's had a great season. He's yeah. having a very good season. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, I, and I think what they're doing too is, is, is making the Australian public realise, stand up and think, geez, you know, they're not that bad, That's these guys. Pumps, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's been English, the same in English, years. Englishman, Danny, not... We're Englishmen, okay. Okay, sorry, guys. Uh, We've only got, go got a minute left. We've only got a minute left in this section. So, Callum Watkins in one centre. Who's your other centre? Who's your other centre? In the dream. Team. Well, I, I think it's a position where we struggle a little bit, isn't it? Centre. Uh, uh, you know, some people go Shenton. I've yeah, got yeah, yeah, Shenton. Yeah, I've got Shenton. I'll tell you what, last week, you mentioned Shenton. He had Callum Watkins on toast last week, didn't he? You know, Callum at times people say how good he is, but he's again it's just that consistency it's level, that concentration. That and it was exactly champions. it was experience that had uh, Callum Watkins on toast last week. Yeah. It was good to see the experience against the inexperience. Okay, well we are gonna draw an end to that as well, uh, because we're right, we're, but we're we're gonna do the rest of the dream team in the third part. We're gonna talk about the NRL as well, the two semi finals that are coming up, which are absolutely mouth watering, and maybe touch on one or two other issues as well. But the next subject is gonna be half facts. We're gonna be talking about half facts for the dream team with these two. Wow, can't wait for that. <laughs> Uh, so join us after this break. We're back in just a few moments' time. So welcome back to the ARC at Headingley for our third and final part. And as is the tradition, we're going to be talking much more about the NRL in this bit. But we've got a bit of unfinished business to do from the Dream Team. So let's rattle through this. And this will be an easy one because, well, it won't be easy because there's such a plethora of highly qualified and talented uh, halfbacks knocking around in the British game at the moment. So who's your halfback pairing in the Dream, uh, dream Team? Go in the uh, Dream Team, it's, uh, Danny Maguire and, Scott and uh, Gale. Right. Luke Gale. Luke Gale. Right. OK. Uh, Danny Maguire and Danny Bruff for me. Right, yeah. I think I went Bruff and Maguire as well. Mm. Bruff and Maguire. Uh, and as far as the forwards are concerned, this, I think this is really difficult, the forwards. Yeah, it is. This, is the re this is really shows where the strength is. I think game. Alex Wormsley uh, yeah. has, has been the form, yeah. you know, standout prop of the season. And on the other side of balancing him, you'd probably go for Chris Hill, who in a struggling Warrington team has been absolutely, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, there's a reason why I've gone for Chris Hill. Right. Because I'm saving a surprise for later, Woodsy. Okay, that's uh, that's a okay, uh, Roby. Would you put something in the back row, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> yeah, just to spoil the surprise. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Hooker Roby. Hooker Roby. Your yeah. prop, who's your props though? Wormsley and yeah, yeah, Wormsley. I wouldn't disagree uh, with Hill, but I think you know Kyle Moore. I think he's uh, yeah. he's he's a uh, what about Andy Lynch? Uh, Lynchy, you wouldn't rule him out as well. No. And also as well, the other front row, Millington. I think he's been outstanding. And mm -hmm. when you look at certainly the yeah, man of yeah, steel's yeah. coming round as well. You wouldn't rule out, as we know, he gets picked by the players now. So Andy Lynch and Millington, certainly, they wouldn't, uh, they would, should be with a shout. The, no, the, none of those guys would let you down. No, not at all. Roby, both your hookers, then. Yeah. Yeah. Both of you. Not Aiton, Paul Aiton, before he was injured? No. No? No. No? Macaurum, his importance to Wigan? No. No? No? OK, fair enough. <laughs> back row. So your back row, as a, as a whole. Well, I'm going with Cuthbertson at, at, at 13. At 13. Know, I, th I think he's, he's that old-fashioned prop forward that can play at 13. I know Paul Gallon's done it, you know, down for the Blues particularly. Yep. Um, I, I think he's been a revelation, not so much the last few weeks for Leeds, but uh, but yeah, if I can't play him at prop, I'd probably keep him at 13 because I don't think we have 
many contenders at 13 woods? Well, we've got one. There's an old-fashioned proper <coughs> loose yeah. forward. It's Sean O'Loughlin, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's about it. Yeah. So, second rowers, Elliot White from Catalans. I think he's been outstanding again. Oh, Zeb Tyre. I was going to say, Zeb Tyre. Zeb Tyre, yeah, but you know, Elliot White for mine, he's got his consistency mm. after last year, a quality season again, he's just backed that up. Liam Farrell's had a good year again, steady away for Wigan. And, I, and I think Mark oh, yeah, Bateman's yeah, Bateman yeah. been great. I thought Mark Minicello has been a real good performer for Hull as well. Right. So okay. there's plenty of variation, isn't there, this year yeah, for, for, for the dream Who's your coach? Who's your dream coach? Who do you put in charge of all them? I put Darryl Powell, Powell in. Yeah, yeah. Darryl Powell. That's unequivocal. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Right, good. Boxed in less than two minutes and 40 seconds. Well done. Thank you. Right, NRL. Uh, fantastic semi-finals to look forward to. And the possibility of not a Sydney side <laughs> inside. Just the Roosters flying the Sydney flag at the moment. Yeah, that's correct. we got... Um the Roosters play Brisbane, yep. and then on the other uh, semi qualifying final is is uh, the Cowboys and the Storm. So there's going to be one uh, interstate side playing in the grand final, and I think a lot of Sydney siders are hoping that the Roosters can beat Brisbane. That's going to be a really tough game, and, yeah. and um, or, or both of them, you know, the Storm and the Cowboys. But I, I'd probably tend to favour the Cowboys. Um, because of one player, and Jonathan it's going to be Thurston. a great, yeah, Jonathan Thurston. Yeah. It's going to going to be a great tussle between the two halves. With Cooper Cronk yeah. for Melbourne and Jonathan Thurston yeah. um, for the Cowboys, it, it, it's it's that's worth the admission alone going there to watch these two guys play. Yeah. And uh, they've been very good on the road this year as well of the Cowboys, haven't they? Yes, I, they've almost been better away from home than than they have at home. So the fact that they're going down to Melbourne, I don't think is going to bother them no. that much. And I and I think a lot of t uh, emotionally people, I think would like to see the Cowboys get to the grand final because over the last couple of seasons they've been in the same position yep. and have been robbed by bad calls and, and, and it's been proven, you know, on video mm. and everything yeah. it was a wrong call and it's cost them the opportunity. So yeah. Um, hopefully, yeah, they've got themselves back in that situation again and, and hopefully nothing happens and they, you know, it's, it comes down to the way they play and, yeah. and um, they can get there by beating Melbourne. But Brisbane and the Roosters, geez, uh, you know, as I said, Trent Robertson's done a magnificent job with the Roosters. They've won the minor premiership three years in a row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but as we were talking earlier, nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> no one cares. But unfortunately, they haven't been able to convert it into a premiership win. They, yeah. they won one, but but you know, one out of three or mm. one out of two at the moment it remains to be seen whether they can win two out of three. But but um, yeah, they, they and they've lost. Uh, Mitchell Pearce has been out for a while. I think he's back now. Um, Weira Hargraves, he's he's out for the season, mm. and a lot of people, including myself, thought, well, that'll be the finish of the Roosters. Um, but the, you know, they did, they got beaten by the Storm, and they come back and they played the Bulldogs, which was always going to be a tough game. They've come through and they've and they've won that in the end quite convincingly. So, look, you know, they're not out of this, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with against Brisbane. It, is, it'll be a great game. Is there a feeling when they say, do, do other clubs get behind the Roosters now because they want to see a Sydney side in there? A, a kind of club loyalty is lost, you know, if you're a Bulldogs <laughs> fan or a Souths fan, do you actually now think, come on the Roosters? Well, I think, yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, you, you'll, you'll have your, your supporters from, from of other Sydney teams and they'll all be backing the Roosters. Really? But at the end of the day, <laughs> it, it just comes down to whichever side performs well on the day and and experience plays a big hand in it, mm. you know, and, and um, if you look at Brisbane and they've got an experienced coach, uh, you know, Trent Robinson obviously is, you know, got the Roosters to a grand final before, he knows what it's all about, but when you look at Wayne Bennett and the uh, number of premierships he's won and, and what he's done with Brisbane this year uh, from where they were last year, it's, it's just been a great effort and, uh, they, and also their players, it, you know, they've got a lot of experience there and, and some good young kids as well and, um, young Ben Hunt, the halfback, he's yep. a player to watch. And, yep. mm. um, I saw a bit of him in the test series yeah, last year. Yeah, I, I think he's a future origin yeah. halfback. But yeah, it's a tough one to choose, you know. Mm. Both games, very hard to pick who could Come win. on, Brett, we don't sit on the fence of this programme, so who are you going for? <laughs> we don't sit on the fence, son. Cowboys and Brisbane. There you go. Cowboys and Brisbane. All right. Right. And all I'm going Roosters and Melbourne. Right. We can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? If Leeds were the only Yorkshire team in semi-finals and, and Cass fans and Wakefield fans... Oh, well, you won't get, you, you get Cass Wakefield and Bradford <laughs> fans support. No, 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 that would never happen. Come on, Yorkshire. It, it was like Hulk Yard in the Challenge Cup final. The whole fans want support. support and then you'd say, that would never happen over here, would it? No. no way. And is Melbourne almost like a third Queensland team? There must be a lot of love in Queensland <laughs> for Melbourne. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, they, there's a lot of players that... Uh, well, their feeder club is based in Queensland. Yeah. And... Um, a lot of yeah, a lot of Queenslanders go there and play, but 
the big thing for, for Melbourne, obviously, is their big three, Cooper Cronk, um, Slater and Cameron Smith. And um, it's amazing how the other guys go to the club and, and, and just feed off these three blokes. You know? yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that the coach would be saying to them, you do your job. These three guys will win you the game, and, yeah. and, and that just seems to be the way they play. They, they all seem to know what their job is, and they do it to the best of their ability, and, and then they just wait for, yeah. for Cronk, Smith, and Slater to do their thing. You see, my, my father-in-law, and hello, John, because he will be watching, he watches every week, um, say he watches all the rugby league, all the rugby league, British and Australian, and, and he'll tell you, and I think a lot of people will agree with him, that the English, te- English rugby league is better to watch, is more enjoyable to watch these mm-hmm. days because there's more craft, there's more creativity, mm-hmm. there's more off the cuff. The Australian game is far too structured. Yeah, it is. It is it's far too structured. And, and, and even we were talking to Scurry about it the other day, you know, the, the players nowadays don't seem as if they can read a game mm. Mm. because they don't have to think anymore. Is that because it's too big, too fast and too physical, Brett? Do they just not get the time on the ball well, and the space on the is, ball to, to, yes, to have that luxury? It is, it is faster, it's a lot faster now. Um, but I, I tend to think it's because of the way they're coached. Okay. Um, with the game, you mentioned the structure, it's, it's just too structured now. Yeah. Um, there's none of this, you know, well, we've got the ball to so second tackle, what are we going to do? Oh, we'll throw it here and oh, no. we, they're short out there, we'll, we'll get... what. Well, None of that because, oh, well, it's the second tackle. Yes, well, on the third, we've got to be 10 metres from the sideline. So they take it back there. And a a perfect example was in an Origin game this year and and, um, Michael Ennis was in a dummy half. It was the last tackle. He's gone the short side. He's got a four on two guys outside. There's three on on two or three three on on one. one. Yeah. And he's kicked it. Yeah. Because it was the last tackle. That's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 love, I, I, I catch most of the NRL games, Dave, and I love watching it. And I know what you mean about more structured. I think the main difference is that they don't make as many mistakes yeah. as we do. I think we would probably be more structured a game if we didn't have as much of a broken uh, affair because we've got players taking bad options, loose carries. And, mm. and, and, and I've always said, and it's been a bugbear of mine for a couple of years, we confuse excitement with good rugby league. Yeah. And I think you get... Well, Bet- better rugby league. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just look at the scores, though. The they still that, score a point. You're yeah, not getting the other, six, si- the other side games. of that, though, is Adam Cuthbertson, who personifies the whole difference. Yeah. In Australia, a good player. In England, a breath of fresh air. Yeah. And he feels the liberty and the freedom of playing in England. Yeah, yeah well, when he's been, you know, he's been given that role. Uh, obviously, Matt Dermott's seen something in there where you know he's he's got a good pass in him. He's got a good offload as as the terminology is nowadays, and he's been allowed to express himself uh, uh, all the time, hasn't he? But you don't get that in Australia from there. And yeah, he should be allowed a little bit more loosely, but. Uh, yeah, over here, they've seen the talent, what it's got. So, as I keep harping on, and me and Brett's had a few conversations about it now, you know, let them play us. If they've got, if they, they've got that sort of talent, don't take it away from them and let them express themselves and play with that bit of vision, that bit of awareness, you know, as, as, as we know, that's what halfbacks do, you know, you, your back rowers get yourself wide, run into them gaps. And McDermott sees somebody Cuthbertson, and we've all seen what he can do when he's allowed to express himself. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, as a coach, you've got to look at. You've got to be able to see. <laughs> what comes natural to a player and allow him to do that. Yeah. Um, I always remember Jack Gibson, who I played under at Parramatta in the early 80s, and he said his biggest fear as a coach was overcoaching players. Mm. Mm. And I think now in Sydney, or sorry, in Australia, in the NRL, because it's so structured, we don't get to see some of these guys, who I believe have got a lot of ability, natural ability, we don't get to see them use it because they're not allowed to. Yeah. They're, yeah, not, they're not encouraged to. Not encouraged yeah. to do it. I'd prefer to watch. I've watched the Super League, and I quite enjoy that because there's a lot more ball movement, and they look as if mm. they're trying to create something. Yeah. In the NRL, they don't try and create anything. Well, it's about it's it. about not making mistakes Mistake, first and yeah. foremost, isn't it? It's going through sets. I mean, I agree with you on Adam Cuthbertson, and I think it's been great how McDermott has brought that part out of his mm. game, probably that was suppressed when he was down in the NRL. Exactly. You know, absolutely. But at the same time, we don't have a lot of Adam Cuthbertsons about. Mm. We, we do have a lot of players who, um, you know, are, are numbers players. But really. also as well, when you, when you look at the way Cuthbertsons plays, the back, that back line has certainly benefited, haven't they? You know, because the, the support players, what Leeds have got, like the Paul Ayrton, how good, how well he was playing before he got injured, off the back mm. of Cuthberts, and then also to the support players in Maguire and Burrow, and then the passing there to, uh, to Joel Moon and Watkins well, and the wingers like and Adek are coming in. It's been a great fascination. It's been great expression mm. from Cuthberts, and it's brought the best out of his players now, around him. Do you think there's been a little bit, and I've seen this in Leeds the last three weeks, that, that too many of his teammates are trying to be 
be the same. I've never seen Jamie Peacock offload as much mm. as I have this season, and it hasn't always worked. And as much as Leeds have scored far more points than anyone else, they've also got the worst defensive record in the top four. But that, isn't, that, isn't that the key fact? If you're scoring more points than anyone else, you're winning I games. I thought it was about winning titles. It. That's my philosophy. If you score more points than anybody else, you win the game, don't you? Yeah. Simple yeah. If, you, if you score 30 and they only score 20, you've won the game. Who cares <laughs> if you let in three tries? The problem is when you only score 18, though, would it? Oh, and they yeah. score 20. Yeah. Maths was never your strong point. <laughs> Does, do you see an evolution? I mean, you, I mean, you watch the first ever Origin game and there's no structure to it whatsoever, is there, when you see that, that the old video and it's evolved to where it is. Do you see the evolving to where coaches cotton on and think, hang on, let's let's try and be a bit riskier here. Do you see that developing over the next few years? Well, I, I, I think it might, yes. I, I, I tend to think that the whole game is, is slowly starting to change in the, in the NRL. They, they, they are introducing less um, interchange, mm. which will eventually slow the game down a little bit. I personally believe the referees are struggling to keep up with yeah. the pace of the game. Mm. Um, so then that'll slow the game. The people are saying, oh, you know, you'll lose the big guys. They won't be, no one will want them anymore. But I think that the clubs will still keep the big guys. They're just the game will get a little bit slower, which then will encourage the smaller guys to come into their own towards the end of the game. And I think it, it is slowly starting to get to that stage where um, coaches will then look at it and say, well, we can't be too structured anymore because we've got opportunities now to yep. create something yep. and we we'll want these guys to start being creative. Yep. And then hopefully, and I've said it for a long time, if a coach came in in the NRL and coached the side and, he, and they played the way the game was played in the 80s and early 90s and they won a competition, Everyone that's the way it would go. Hold, 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 that thought, hold yeah. that thought for a fortnight's time because we're going to have to leave it there because we've run right out of time. Thanks very much to Brett Kenny for joining us today yeah. and also to Danny Lockwood and to Gary Schofield. Before we go, let's just remind ourselves of uh, what's happening on this very channel, Premier Sports, in the next uh, 24 hours, 48 hours. The two NRL semi-finals this weekend starting Friday, tomorrow, if you're watching us on Thursday night, 10.30 a.m. it's live. It is the Broncos against the Roosters. And then on Saturday, 10 a.m. start on this channel, Saturday the 26th, the Storm against the Cowboys. They are going to be two fabulous matches to get your lips smacking and your mouths watering. We've had a fantastic time today. I've had a fantastic time as well because I've been sat with one of my heroes, with Brett Kenny. Thank you very much to Brett. Um, also to Danny Lott, what is that? He's a bit of a hero status. And Gary Schofield, <laughs> who's, who's up there as well. Till next time, goodbye. <laughs>